This video is sponsored by Dubby Jitterless Energy Blend. Click on the link in the description and use the code PACKERMAN to save 10% on any order. I read one time a tornado described as an oily column of death. And, uh, you know, that comes as close as describing uh, what went on that day as anything I can think of. You know, everyone says, everybody knows somebody who's been affected by cancer, but if you've lived in this area for the last 25 years, you know someone that was affected personally by that tornado, even if they weren't in it. This storm hit without any warning. I mean, that's what it's called, the storm without any warning. And that just can't be. It was 1990. We're not talking about 1940 or 1950 or the 1800s. We're talking about modern times. At no time during my experience did I ever think the word tornado. That opening that you just saw was from the video, Eight Minutes in August, a video that you can watch on YouTube right now. It basically shows you everything that happened regarding the tornado that we're going to be talking about today, the 1990 Plainfield F5 tornado. This is Tornado Tales. Look, oh, that is scary. The truck is, oh my gosh. Holy smokes. Sorry about that. I was testing out my microphone's uh, reverb option. <laughs> so you're going to get an echo effect, which is pretty cool. But anyways, welcome, everybody, to this edition of Tornado Tales, where today we're going to be talking about what may very well be one of the most uh, controversial tornadoes that I've ever talked about. And that is the 1990 Plainfield Tornado. One that happened without any warning. It sounds like people were so caught unaware. Was there enough of a tornado warning? Uh, to my knowledge, there was no warning. No warning whatsoever. You, of course, knew that it was a tornado. Uh, I knew it was a tornado at the point that the roof became to, ripped off. We had no warning that it was a tornado up until that time. I have no warning. Before we get into things here, I want to give a shout out to Carly Anna WX. Uh, she also covers uh, tornadoes on her channel. And she basically researched a lot of the stuff that uh, I wasn't even aware of about this tornado. And let me tell you something. Some of the stuff that she uncovered was just mind-blowing. Like, I knew... Just from reading about it that this was not a good tornado because of the fact that uh there was no warning there was absolutely no warning that came out of this tornado and i knew that when from all the stories that i've read in the past i did not realize how bad it actually was and i'm just gonna give a little bit of a warning right now this may get a little bit heated you know for some of my storytelling shows, I want to try to refrain from using language as much as I possibly can. But I'm just going to give you fair warning right now. That may not be the case this time around because a lot of the stuff that I've researched and read online, especially after uh, Carly's uh, video came out last year, Really, really pissed me off. It really did. So, um, what do you say we dive right into it, shall we? This tornado was also highly unusual in that this is the only recorded instance of an F5 tornado to ever occur in the month of August since record keeping was kept in 1950. 
August the 28th, 1990, was the day that this tornado occurred. The only time in the month of August that an F5 has occurred, and the only F5 or EF5 rated tornado to strike the Chicago area. And even though there was a video that surfaced online in 2011 showing the supercell that spawned the tornado, there are no known photographs or videos of this tornado, mainly because it was rain wrapped, so it couldn't be seen anyways. But the fact that there are no known videos of this tornado, despite the fact that video cameras were now pretty prevalent in the 1990s, it just makes this tornado even more mysterious than it already was. Now, meteorologists were well aware that this particular storm had the potential to produce an extremely powerful tornado, considering the fact that the convective available potential energy or keep value of the storm was in excess of 8,000 joules per kilogram. 8,000. Just to give you uh, some perspective, generally values in excess of 1,500 are considered to be moderately unstable, whereas values of more than 4,000 are considered extreme. This sucker had 8 thousand joules per kilogram that is a lot of energy so this storm had a lot of potential to produce a violent tornado and well that's exactly what happened so this particular supercell thunderstorm uh, formed in the vicinity of janesville and south central wisconsin shortly after 12 p.m central time it produced a tornado near pecatonica illinois and winnebago Cal uh, winnebago county about 15 miles west of Rockford, which touched down at about 1.42 p.m. Central Time. That tornado did not last very long. However, the storm continued to move southeast towards the Aurora area, and it spawned four more short-lived tornadoes. Not in rapid session, like some people were claiming in the media, which we'll get to that when we get to it. But it lasted between... 2.45 p.m. and 3.15 p.m. So within the period of about a half an hour, there were these four smaller tornadoes that spawned one after the other after the other. One would touch down and then lift, and then several minutes later, the storm would recycle and drop another one. What gets to me is the fact that there were people that were watching this storm, storm spotters that were on the ground. They were watching this, and they were seeing all of these smaller tornadoes touch down, lift, the storm will recycle, another one would touch down, so on and so forth. That is an, a strong indicator that this supercell had a lot of energy to burn. And when typically when you have these supercell thunderstorms dropping all these different smaller tornadoes, one after the other, after the other, after the other, that was usually an indicator that eventually this sucker was going to drop a massive one a long track tornado with violent wind speeds. And unfortunately for the Chicago area, that's exactly what happened. As the supercell began to move to the Southeast, starting at about 3.15 PM, the supercell would spawn the principal tornado that would eventually become the Plainfield F5 tornado. Touching down near Oswego in Kendall County and rapidly strengthening strengthening into a F2 and F3 tornado as they approached Will County. The tornado traveled southeast into Wheatland Township, Will County, near the Wheatland Plains subdivision, northwest of Plainfield. At 3.25 p.m. in Wheatland Township, the tornado damaged nearly all of the homes in the Wheatland Plains subdivision where there were several injuries, including one child who had to be airlifted to Loyola University Hospital in Maywood, where they would later die from their injuries, unfortunately. Twelve homes were completely destroyed in Wheatland Plains. So, this tornado had not even reached maximum intensity yet, and this sucker was already destroying homes. The tornado continued to strengthen as it tore across open farmland and actually reached F5 intensity in this area. A very narrow swath of very intense ground scouring was observed, as mature corn crop was completely stripped from the ground leaving nothing but bare soil behind, and several inches of topsoil were removed as well. You know when a tornado, and I've mentioned this in the past couple of episodes, I think I mentioned it in the um, more tornado episode. 
when a tornado has is able to do extreme ground scouring that's when you know this sucker is extremely powerful to be able to just dig right into the ground and basically make these deep trenches just from sucking the topsoil up i mean the amount of energy and power that a tornado has to have to be able to do that is incredible and that's where the f5 rating came from was the intense ground scouring in this particular area not only that but as the tornado crossed us 30 a 20 ton tractor trailer was thrown more than half a mile from the road bear in mind 20 tons that is 40,000 pounds i mean the amount of wind speed that you need to generate to lift that sucker off the road and throw it for half a mile like just think about that for a second i mean the amount of strength that is necessary to do that is just it's mind-blowing it's absolutely mind-blowing and unfortunately this also killed the driver obviously and there were three other motorists that were killed in this area as their vehicles were thrown from the road as well and some cars were picked up and carried considerable distances through the air. And it was determined that the tornado reached its peak strength in, the, in this area. And the F5 rating was based on the extreme ground scouring that occurred. Like I said, beyond this point, the ground scouring became less pronounced as the tornado weakened slightly. But it was still at high end F4 intensity as it approached Plainfield. And then the tornado struck Plainfield, Illinois, where it got its name at around 328 p.m. Two minutes later, the tornado directly struck the Plainfield High School, killing three people, including a science teacher and two maintenance workers. There were students that had been practicing out on the football field for their fall football programs, and they ran into the high school to take shelter a few minutes before the storm hit. After an alarm was pulled by a dean in the main office, there were actually volleyball players that were preparing for a game in the gymnasium, and they were rushed out into the hallway. Um... It was reported that as soon as the last player was through the door, a coach quickly closed it, only for it to be immediately ripped off by the storm. Uh, the gymnasium proceeded to fall apart and crash down, which filled the gap in the doorway. They took shelter in the same hallway as the football team, and once the tornado had passed, that was the only hallway left standing in the entire building. The tornado then demolished the Plainfield School District Administration Building, where the wife of a custodian was killed. The tornado then crossed Route 59, Division Street, and ripped into the St. Mary Immaculate Church and School, claiming an additional three lives, including the principal of the school, a music teacher, and the son of a cook at the rectory. Fifty-five homes were destroyed in Plainfield itself, a few of which were swept away. A grocery store east of the high school was also badly damaged. Gravestones in the nearby cemetery were toppled, and a metal dumpster was found wrapped around the top of a partially debarked tree. Damage in Plainfield was rated as high-end F4. So even though it was not an F5 at this point, I mean, this was still an extremely violent tornado going through a heavily populated area. And bear in mind, there was no warning whatsoever. Not at this point in time. The, the amount... the the only thing that was issued at this point was a severe thunderstorm watch. There was no mention of tornadoes whatsoever. There was no tornado watches or anything of that nature, which is another thing that I will be talking about here momentarily that made this tornado very, very infamous, especially in the meteorology field. The tornado continued working its way southeast, now towards the large city of Juliet, Illinois damaging homes in the Crystal Lawns, Lily Cash, and Warwick subdivisions and killing five more people. One in the Lily Cash subdivision of Plainfield and two each in the Crystal Lawns and Warwick subdivisions. An additional three people would later succumb to injuries sustained from the tornado. The tornado ripped through the Grand Prairie Elementary School in the Plainfield School District causing significant damage. Observers watched from the doors at the Lewis uh, Juliet Mall as the tornado passed southwest of them. 69 homes were destroyed in Crystal Lawns, 75 were destroyed in Peerless Estates, 55 were destroyed in Lily Cash, and 50 homes were destroyed in Warwick. Most of the homes in Peerless Estates and Warwick were also newly built, and they were completely destroyed. 
The tornado then moved towards Crest Hill. At 3.38 p.m., the storm ripped through the Crest Hill Lake apartment complex where it caused F3 damage and claimed another eight lives, destroying one apartment building and half of another apartment building. Neither have ever been rebuilt, and all of the victims were found in a cornfield not too far from the apartment complex. The tornado also ripped through the Colony West subdivision, destroying 12 townhomes, none of which have ever been rebuilt either. A married couple died while in their car on Cedarwood Drive outside the apartment complex, which was also covered on uh, the news footage that I will be showing you here momentarily. Uh, the tornado then destroyed three apartment buildings on Elizabeth Court. Three more homes were destroyed in Bridal Wet. Three more homes were destroyed in Bridal Wreath, southeast of Elizabeth Court. Homes were damaged on Arden Place, and two high-tension wire structures were destroyed at Douglas Street and Palladium Drive West. Further southeast, the tornado continued to lose strength and finally lifted near Woodlawn Avenue and Campbell Street and Juliet. The parent thunderstorm continued until it crossed over the Indiana border, where it dissipated around 4.30 p.m. According to reports, the tornado had lifted at 3.45 p.m. Central Time, and there wasn't a tornado warning issued by the National Weather Service until 3.51 p.m. Six minutes after the tornado had already dissipated. Like, what in the actual hell? Why did it take so damn long for a tornado warning to be issued and for it to be issued six minutes after the fact? Like, are you serious? Like, that is a complete fail on the part of the National Weather Service. A complete and total failure. Absolutely ridiculous. So the final tally from this tornado, 29 people would die from the Plainfield tornado with 353 injuries, 1,470 homes were either damaged or destroyed, causing $165 million in damage back in 1990. So, what exactly happened? What exactly happened to cause such a complete failure on the part of the National Weather Service? Well, for starters, prior to 1990, the National Weather Service office in Chicago was responsible for providing forecasts for the entire state of Illinois. Excuse me? So in other words, you just have one office providing National Weather Service forecasts for the state of Illinois. I mean, that right there is just a disaster waiting to happen because, I mean... When you consider the fact that you have this one office providing forecasts for an entire state. I mean, Illinois is not exactly a small state either. I mean, the Chicago office was completely overwhelmed with its workload. And not having multiple offices, you know, looking after their own regions like a lot of states do today. I mean, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So there was that going on. There was also heavy criticism for the National Weather Service for, for providing no warning whatsoever of the approaching tornado, especially from the NOAA Disaster Survey Report, which I will be getting to that here momentarily. Uh, they were also highly critical of the forecast process within the Chicago office, as well as the coordination within local spotter networks and the preparedness of these groups. There were no, warning, there were no warnings issued by the office whatsoever until 2.32 p.m., nearly an hour after the first tornado was sighted southeast of Rockford. Considering how fast tornadoes can move, the fact that there was no warnings issued whatsoever until nearly an hour after the first tornado was sighted, I mean, that's just unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. I don't care if you're talking about 1990 standards or today's standard. The fact that you have weather radar you have all these different storm spotters out in the field and that was another thing communication was absolute shit okay let's just be completely real here the lack of communication between storm spotters and the national weather service was absolutely abysmal and that also led to 
the fact that there was no warnings issued until after the tornado had already dissipated. It was a multifaceted failure of the highest degree. And this is what you would call a worst case scenario if you're the National Weather Service. I mean, does it happen that tornado warnings are missed when tornadoes actually hit? Yeah, I mean, it does happen. But when you have a case like this, where not only did they miss a, a, a warning for a particularly violent tornado such as this, this was a tornado that was rated an F5, the highest on the Fujita scale. No excuse. Absolutely no excuse for a violent, powerful tornado such as this, especially an F5, to go without a tornado warning until six minutes after the fact. No goddamn excuse for that. None. The National Weather Service deserved every bit of criticism that was thrown their way. Absolutely. As a result of this lack of a warning, many meteorologists today refer to this as Plainfield Syndrome, where now the, the idea is it's better to issue too many warnings and be wrong than to miss one critical warning and, well, have what happened in Plainfield, an F5 being completely missed. That is what you consider a worst case scenario. And I mean, it just gives me a headache just thinking about it. Like, how do you miss something like that? I mean, I know radar systems were still not exactly state of the art in 1990, but good God, you had a network of storm spotters in the area that could have warned the National Weather Service about this and nothing was done. Absolutely nothing was done until it was already passed. Like, it's absolutely unacceptable in this case. But just when you thought it couldn't get worse, it does. Because the news media's role in this whole thing. I mean... Because I was watching... Carly Anna's video on the Plainfield tornado that she did last year. And she covered the news media's role in this whole thing. Like, I knew it was bad. I knew it was bad because I knew about the fact that no warning was ever issued for this tornado. But for the news media to try to twist the narrative is just, it's just sickening. And it gives me a migraine headache just thinking about it. You know, and it's just like, how can you even trust news media at this point? When you have all these people in the news media back in 1990 that were trying to basically do PR and all this other shit. You know, basically going into CYA mode for the National Weather Service and all that other stuff. And... For those of you that don't know, CYA uh, stands for cover your ass. Basically, they were trying to make all these excuses and try to cover their own ass to avoid all the backlash, the inevitable backlash from not from all these people not having received any warning about this tornado whatsoever. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch uh, this clip of um, this uh, news broadcast uh, I guess a Chicago Channel 2 broadcast of these three individuals that are talking about how, you know, the National Weather Service, did they drop the ball and all this other stuff and how they're talking about, you know, how, you know, just a bunch of nonsense. I mean, it, it's just sickening to, to have to go back and watch this, but let's go through it and then we'll uh, talk about it after. A tornado warning did come across our newswire here at Channel 2 at 3.51 from the National Weather Service. But that was some six minutes after the fact. A spotter had seen it hit the Crest Hill area at about 3.45 this afternoon. Then that brings about a difficult question. Did the National Weather Service fumble the ball on this one? And I think not. Not uh, at all in this particular situation. They are in a very difficult position. The National Weather Service, when it comes to severe weather, relies on two things. 
radar, which is excellent for picking up rain and precipitation and snow and whatnot, but it's not uh, too proficient at picking up tornadoes. Probably less than 10% of the time can we see a tornado uh, with a, a live color radar. So then they are relying upon an intricate spotter network, a spotter network that includes people like perhaps your next door neighbor, policemen, firemen, city and town officials. They rely on those spotters to go out during severe weather, to detect it, to call it into the National Weather Service, where then the National Weather Service will disseminate the information out to radio and television stations, where we then bring it to you. The information was brought to them at 345 this afternoon. They got the information out to radio and television stations some six minutes later. That's pretty quick. But the bottom line is here that typically when tornadoes are spotted by a spotter network, they're usually in more rural areas. There is time for people to react and time for people to take cover. In this situation, the tornado that hit was almost instantaneously a killer. There, the National Weather Service's hands are tied. It's unfortunate. But Let's stop right there for a minute. This person on the left here, who I assume is the meteorologist for the station, uh, I was talking about how they received a tornado warning at 3:51. Like I said, six minutes after the fact, when the tornado uh, after the tornado hit Crest, uh, Crest Hill area, and he says, "Did the National Weather Service fumble the ball here?" And he says, "I think not." And I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, "What? Like you can't be freaking serious here? Like you just mentioned?" that they did not receive a tornado warning until six minutes after the tornado had already dissipated. And you're honestly going to sit there and say that the National Weather Service did not fumble the ball. They said, I did, I think not. Like, are you freaking kidding me in there? Okay, it is the National Weather Service's freaking job to warn the public about impending severe weather. And for them to not do so is a serious direction of their duty. It's horribly irresponsible to have all of these storm spotters and the National Weather Service, you know, just completely fumble the ball because they, that's absolutely what they did to completely fumble the damn ball in warning the public about impending severe weather. So for this guy to come out and say that, oh, they didn't fumble the ball, oh, bullshit. Bullshit. Okay? That is a bunch of friggin' nonsense right there. It really is. And yes, I do understand the fact that, you know, the radar systems of the time, at the at that point, were not completely capable of seeing the development of tornadoes and all that stuff because, I mean, it was still old radar technology from the 70s and stuff like that. Of course, this event would lead to the development of the next-gen radar system, which I will get to here in a little bit. But, you know, for him to try to make that kind of excuse, it's just like, it's irresponsible. It's absolutely irresponsible for him to do that. And that's all I got to say about that. Moving on. I would agree. I was watching it. I'm, I'm not in the weather business myself, but it was enough information was there so that I came in. I was over by, with you gentlemen by the weather wires. I was able to put two and two together to say, look, we have the potential here. Let's just watch it closely. And if you'll notice the track, the track comes from north. And our first reports were actually from around in Winnebago County, around Rockford. Yeah. And then it swung down. And while we were still watching the red and the yellow coloring on the radar, then it developed and hit very fast, like three or four tornadoes just dropped down and, and then took it. What made this next part? really irritating and this is what pissed me off the most is the fact that that gentleman in the center the news broadcaster that is bill curtis for those of you that don't know bill curtis is a legend in the broadcast field particularly in the chicago area and what is so frustrating about it is the fact that this is the very same bill curtis who was on the airwaves in Topeka, Kansas in 1966 when an F5 tornado came roaring through that area and he was on the airwaves telling people and this is a quote from uh, that broadcast for God's sakes take cover and that is a tornado that we'll be covering some, at some point down in, down the future 
and that is a tornado that we will be covering at some point in the future. But his broadcast that day actually was credited with saving many lives because he was on the airwaves saying, for God's sake, take cover because, you know, there's a tornado coming through the area. And that is credited with saving quite a few lives in the Topeka area. So for him to come on this broadcast, knowing, you know, he, he had been through a violent tornado in the past. And for him to come on and say the sort of CYA nonsense that he was saying here. And why do I say that? Well, he's saying that he was watching, you know, the radar. He says he's not in the weather enterprise himself. And he says that he was able to put two and two together. Okay, maybe he was able to, but you have meteorologists there that are able to help you walk you through it because you're working with them. Do you really expect the average layperson in 1990 to understand what goes on with a radar system and what the colors on them are supposed to mean. I mean, it's like James Spann once said uh, during a um, a broad uh, a, um, a coverage of uh, it's like James Spann once said during a documentary of the Tuscaloosa tornado. He says that, you know, you could show people weather radar and stuff, but to a lot of people, it looks like a bucket of spilled paint. And that's you know, that's a perfect analogy to use in this case, because how many people do you expect during that time to understand what goes on on a weather radar? Not very many people. So for Bill Curtis to come on and say that was just kind of weird. But then for him to say that, you know, three to four tornadoes drop down instantaneously just like that. Of course, he's referring to the four smaller tornadoes that happened earlier before the Plainfield tornado. And the fact of the matter is, that's just not true. That's not what happened. Okay, this wasn't a case where four tornadoes dropped down simultaneously and were on the ground simultaneously. No, that is completely false. What happened was, these tornadoes were rapidly coming down one after the other after the other. One would drop, stay on the ground for several minutes, lift, the storm would recycle, and then drop the next one. That's what happened. And this wasn't all at once like he said, this was over the course of a half an hour. But these tornadoes happened between 2.45 p.m. and 3.15 p.m. Over the course of a half an hour. So, for him to come on and say that all four of these smaller tornadoes happened, you know, rapid fire right, right all at once. I mean, you know, for a broadcast legend to come on and say that when it wasn't true. It, it's just incredibly frustrating. And not only that, they're trying to come to conclusions before the investigation is even over. I mean, I mean, the tornado has just passed. People are still trying to figure out what the hell just happened. And are now trying to go into, you know, crash mode where they're trying to go and try to pick up the pieces. And you have these news broadcasters, you know, trying to make sense of anything when the investigation hasn't even been completed yet. And it, it just, it's just so frustrating to watch this now and just, look at the, all the narrative twisting bullshit that was going on here and then as if that wasn't enough to fill your taste with just wretched puke the uh final news anchor this uh woman i don't know who it is and i quite frankly don't give a shit what she says is just disgusting absolutely disgusting the residents we heard from, I think, from Plainfield earlier tonight said, well, we heard about a tornado warning or tore a tornado watch. And I think we hear about those often enough that after a while, they don't always materialize and you, it's like crying wolf in a sense, and you don't expect them actually to happen. Today, we saw what did happen. It only takes one. Right. That'll make you a right. believer. Right. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Now, the part about the cry wolf scenario, unfortunately, that part is true. There have been a lot of cases where, you know, you hear about tornado watches and tornado warnings. You, ha you know, you experience them and nothing ever happens. And it gets to the point where you experience them so much that after you experience them one after the other after the other and nothing happens, you're like, well, it's probably not going to happen. Until that one time when it does happen and it completely ruins your life. And there have been people that have said yeah i didn't really pay attention before but now whenever there's a tornado watch or a tornado warning 
I pay close attention. And Bill Curtis said it best. It only takes one to make you a believer. That much is true. That much I will agree with them on. And unfortunately, the cry wolf scenario, it does exist. Unfortunately. However, what really pissed me off here was the fact that, you know, this woman was saying this. You know, saying, oh, well, it's a cry wolf scenario because they heard from a... She said that they heard from someone in the Plainfield area that day that said, oh, we might have heard a tornado watch or a tornado warning. Here's the problem with that. There was no tornado warning or watch whatsoever. The most that had been issued at that point was a severe thunderstorm watch. There was no indications whatsoever of a tornado watch or a tornado warning. That is complete misinformation. It is horribly irresponsible for this person to go on the air with misinformation like that. There were no watches or warnings whatsoever. And to watch this back, you know, 33 years after this, and to go back and watch this, it just... <clears throat> like, you watch something like this, and it makes you wonder, why the hell is this person still in broadcasting? This person should not have been allowed near a news desk ever again. Like, that is some complete narrative twisting bullshit. And then to after, immediately after that, to go and say, oh, well, it's a cry wolf scenario. How can you blame the victims for not paying attention when there was no warning to begin with? I mean, that is some serious gaslighting bullshit right there. I mean, I know that word is typically overused in the internet nowadays, but Carly Anna said it best. She had never seen gaslighting to that effect. And it's like, how in the actual hell can you blame the public for not paying attention when there was no warning whatsoever? That is some straight gaslighting bullshit that that news anchor tried to do right there. Like, that is absolutely putrid. It really is. And it just shows you how in the how in the actual hell can you trust news media from that point forward? I know I wouldn't. Because, you know, all they do is this PR, you know, manipulative bullshit. And it's just like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it whatsoever. Absolutely disgusting. But that wasn't all. That wasn't all in the BS uh, department. As it turns out, there was actually a lawsuit filed because of this. I will leave a link in the description, but there is a lawsuit of Bergwist versus the U.S. National Weather Service on February the 28th, 1994. So this was basically four years after the whole thing went down. I'm not going to go through all the details because it's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo. But basically, this was basically a class action lawsuit against the National Weather Service for negligence, which I honestly think they should have been punished for. Not only was it, you know, irresponsible, negligence, incompetence, I mean, you name it. I mean, they, they failed their job to the highest order. And the judge in charge of this case actually dismissed the case against the National Weather Service. And it's like Carly Anna said, it leaves you feeling, leaves you with a feeling of no justice, basically. I mean, and I know there's this law in place where, you know, government uh, officials and government uh, employees uh, can't be held responsible for certain uh, certain actions or certain events. But, I mean, here's the thing. It is an entity that is paid for by, with our taxpayer dollars. The least they can do is do their goddamn job. All right? And when they fail to do their job, then they should be made to answer for it. So, seeing this really gave me a massive headache. And it's just like, wow. You know, you have the news media doing their narrative twisting, and then you have... I mean, I, I would like to meet this judge at one point and smack him upside the head and ask him, what the hell were you thinking dismissing this case? When you know damn well that the National Weather, the National Weather Service deserved to answer for their incompetence, their negligence, and basically not doing their damn job. But then came 
the National Weather Service's internal investigation report. And this report made all of those uh, news anchors, um, the judge in, in charge of the uh, class action lawsuit, this report makes all of them look like a bunch of idiots. Because I'm going to post a link to this uh, report down in the description as well. But basically, as the storm moved into the warning area of the Weather Service Forecast Office at Chicago, the severe weather services provided were not as timely or accurate as they might have been. The first two severe thunderstorm warnings issued at Chicago were for locations that remained to the north and east of the actual path of the severe weather. The large hail damaging winds and tornadoes in southwestern Kane, northeastern Kendall, and western Will counties occurred essentially without warnings of any type and effect. The last several minutes of the major tornado were covered by a severe thunderstorm warning that included western Will County. During the time that the supercell storm was moving through Kane, Kendall, and Will counties, neither the staff at Marseille nor Chicago recognized severe thunderstorm signatures or indicators of the storm's tornadic potential exhibited by its radar echo. Few reports of severe weather, none of funnel clouds or tornadoes were received at the Chicago office, contributing to slow recognitions of the continuing serious threat the storm posed. The lack of spotter reports and limited flow of information in Northeast Illinois prior to and during the severe thunderstorm event, coupled with the failure of radar operators and forecasters to recognize the severe nature of the long-lived supercell thunderstorm indicates that training and preparedness activities and severe weather program oversight had not been implemented effectively at Chicago during recent years. Yeah, this was a complete and total failure for the National Weather Service in Chicago. And from what I've heard, that office was basically completely overturned. A lot of people were released in lieu of this report. Basically, <laughs> basically, it was just a complete and total failure. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, what else can you say? When the National Weather Service itself comes out with a report on its internal findings and say, yeah, this was a complete and total failure. I mean, that's pretty damning. That's pretty damning in and of itself. Now, I had mentioned before that this was a series about cautionary tales. And this is one of the biggest ones of all. So, the next question is, was there any good that came out of this unfortunate event? There was. Because substantial safety measures have been enacted in the years following the tornado, including improvements. Among the improvements are frequent, regular tornado drills performed in schools. And there's also the deployment of the next rad radar or next generation radar that has contributed greatly to the ability of meteorologists to recognize tornadic activity. Whereas previous generations of radar can only show reflective re reflectivity data and no direct information on air flows, although tornadic super spells and tornadic signatures such as the hook echo and bounded weak echo region were identifiable. Next rad contained the ability to detect the wind speed and the direction inside the storm. The ability to see rotation inside a storm on both the micro scale and meso scale measurements has allowed forecasters to issue severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings in a more timely fashion and with a higher probability of detection. In addition to that, after the 1990 tornado, the National Weather Service reduced the Chicago office's workload by creating an office in Romeoville in 1993 and in Lincoln, Illinois in 1995 and allowing offices in the Quad Cities, St. Louis, Missouri, Indianapolis, Indiana, Paducah, and Paducah, Kentucky to issue forecasts for their respective areas, which is something that they should have done to begin with. I mean, having one office do forecasts and warning, watches and warnings for an entire state, I mean, that was just a disaster waiting to happen, and that's exactly what happened. In the meantime... Plainfield has uh, rebuilt and is actually thriving at this point in time. After the tornado, Plainfield boomed. Lisa Claus shows me around the rebuilt Plainfield Central High School, a 
far cry from how it looked back in August of 1990. The whole roof had come down and was piled inside the gym. From the gym to the hallways to the classrooms, you can see how the 260 mile an hour winds destroyed the school. Mrs. Kloss was a volleyball coach at the time. She and other coaches likely saved the lives of many of their student athletes. We did the classic, you know, sit down with your back to the wall, cover your head, and um, you know how people say that it sounds like a train, and it, it did. Being a lifelong educator, Mrs. Kloss now uses the Plainfield Tornado as the ultimate teachable moment. She created a PowerPoint slideshow with images like these. Why do you have the PowerPoint? Every year in the fall, before we have our first tornado drill with the kids, I show my students that. I want them to know why we drill. I want them to take it seriously. This location is right in the middle of the path of the storm, 16 miles long from Kendall County through Will, 470 homes destroyed, 1,000 buildings damaged, and 29 people lost their lives. This monument is dedicated to those who died. Less than a mile away sits St. Mary's Immaculate Church, a beautiful building filled with stained glass, the Virgin Mary and Jesus. This building itself can be considered somewhat of a resurrection. The buildings here were totally destroyed. Chopper 2 flew over the collapsed steeple back in 1990. Inside the sanctuary, a mess, debris everywhere, a congregation in shambles. What do you hope is remembered? People who were here remember how everybody pulled together. Having faced a day where it looked like everything was lost, new life came here and new life in ways that people could never imagine. At the end of the day, when you look back on this, this was a tragedy that could have very well been avoided. If the National Weather Service and the storm spotters had been able to get a warning out in a more timely fashion, how many of those 29 people would still be around today? It's one of the biggest what ifs in all of recorded history as far as tornadoes are concerned. It really makes you wonder sometimes. And thus ends the story of the 1990 Plainfield F5 tornado. Certainly got pretty heated during the making of this episode, going through all the details and whatnot. It's just, I mean, I already had a headache to begin with, and going through this all just made it even worse. Just a tale of incompetence, negligence, and just <laughs> a tragedy that honestly didn't need to happen. I mean, I'm not saying that a warning could have saved absolutely everybody, but the least that the National Weather could, could have done was issue a warning, a tornado warning of some sort or something else of that nature. And then once they issue that warning, then the onus is on the public to take that warning seriously. But for the news media to try to twist it and say, oh, well, there was a tornado watch or a tornado warning. No, there wasn't. And the National Weather Service's internal investigation confirmed that. So it turned into gaslighting at that point and twisting the narrative and basically CYA and all that other shit. I mean, it was just absolutely unacceptable and it should not be acceptable, especially by today's standards. This type of shit should not be tolerated, period. And... Anybody who tries to say otherwise is an idiot. I'm sorry. That's just the way I feel about it. But that's all for this edition of Tornado Tales. A very controversial tornado, to say the least. But um, that's going to do it for this edition of Tornado Tales. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, this is the Packer Man signing out. See you later. What's happening, ladies and germs? Thank you for watching tonight's video. If you're interested in sponsoring the channel, there is a link to my Patreon down in the description box below. Otherwise, hit like and subscribe if you want to continue watching great content like you saw today. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, this is the Packer Man, signing out.